My family's been around Renton for 66 years. I think that's my age. We moved here the year I was born um, in, the, in the Highlands area, a small street up there. It was 132nd at that time. It's Union Avenue. It was, um, it was actually not in the city of Renton. It was, it was county uh, where we lived. And uh, the, the community, um, it was... Uh, a vibrant community, um, had some characters, and, um, but when, <clears throat> when we needed to come together, we came together. Um, because during those times, uh, it was pretty rough for, uh, there was very few black families in Renton at that time. Um, so we came together, we attended church together, we had a little store, uh, we'll talk about that later. We had the schools that were <clears throat> known as the black schools. Uh, there was no black educators, no black police officers. Um, the, men, the men did what they could to provide for their families and they were good providers. Um, um, the women mostly stayed home or worked as domestic. So it was a rough time in Renton when most of my uh, friends uh, that I went to Honeydew, McKnight, and Hazelwood. Their parents worked at Boeing or Pat Carr. Uh, my parents were uh, <clears throat> come from the South and were sharecroppers in the South. Came here, and um, it was pretty rough. It was pretty rough on them. And many of the families, most of the families uh, on that hill, on that street, uh, they uh, came from the South. Uh, my dad was born in 1906. Uh, we know when slavery ended <clears throat> in the United States. So my dad didn't, didn't miss slavery by that much. His parents definitely didn't miss it. My grandparents definitely didn't miss it. So um, they came west uh, for a better <clears throat> chance for the kids, grandchildren. And so uh, with this um, presentation, you'll see uh, a little bit of what that community meant uh, to us, and um, and what I want to leave this this will never go away. Now this is uh, it's being recorded. This will never go away uh, because there's so many people that don't know about that black street in the Highlands. This will never go anywhere. My great great grandkids can see this now. Uh, I've written a book that I need somebody to edit for me, Skelton. <laughs> that I'll, I'll need somebody to edit for me, but it, it, it contains a lot of the same information, but it, it's more of, uh, from my eyes, uh, growing up. Uh, I have a, a good friend here, Joyce Reed, as a long, from a long time Renton family. Uh, I talk a lot about her brothers, and um, her brother Frank is really near and dear to my heart, because we played basketball at Hazen together pretty successful and Frank went on to play for the Huskies and Atlanta Falcons, Birmingham Stallions and George she just got a email from her brother George who played at Renton High School he was a cougar though <laughs> you hold that against him. <laughs> <laughs> and went on to play in the Canadian Football League and I don't know if he still holds the rushing records up there but they just named the street after George this week or yeah, they named the street after him. He's got a statue in front of him. So um, it's amazing. To, and we'll get it more. I'll talk more about the professional athletes from that one street from Sunset to Northeast Fourth. It, it's, it's, ama it's an amazing story. Damian Pat nods here also. And I think, is Pat here? Okay, uh, uh, Damian's here. Uh, Damian's from a long list of, he's our superintendent here at Renton Schools from a, um, his grandfather lived on that street. His mother grew up on that street. Uh, his aunt, his uncles uh, grew up on that street. So 
Okay, I, the first slide, this, I, I actually added this today. I, I, I took a picture of a poster I saw um, um, at a place where I was doing a workshop. And, I, and people often ask that question, why is February Black History Month? And in, in a few words, I, I, I felt that this poster uh, described it. And uh, it says February was picked as Black History Month uh, when Carter G. Woodson, some of you may be familiar with him, he's most famous for the book he wrote, The Miseducation of the American Negro. Um, he, he created Black History Week in 1926 and he picked February because it was near the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln, Booker T. Washington, and Frederick Douglass. So that's how February got to be Black History Month. And, uh, and his intent was that this, in this month to remember the achievements of black people in America. Um, this was uh, made especially because black people endured slavery in the early days of the Republic and contributed to various fields even before they were emancipated. For the most part, at least when I went to school, African-American history as well as histories of a lot of other people, of women, um, uh, Latinos, uh, a lot of people who immigrated here, even from Eastern European countries, was never included in our history. Early African-American residents in Renton. I saw this, the Renton History Museum had this great display in City Hall for Black History Month. And so that's why you see all this shine. I took a picture through the glass case. But I was so impressed with this because it, um, it, you know, it says that you know, it's an article from the uh, Seattle PI and it reported the arrival of, of new workers in 1891 who were African American. And I love the way you captured the headline of the article. Two families move into Newcastle without molestation. Mm. I mean, that says it all right there. And uh, the article goes on to say, as you see in the script on the side, that Louisiana-born Henry James and his stepson Clarence Jones, and you knew that family, Jones arrived in Kennedale from East St. Louis in the 1890s. They were recruited by the Oregon Improvement Company at the Newcastle coal mine to break a strike. And neither one of them knew a whit about coal mining, but they knew that they, they felt that things had to be better in Renton than they were where they came from. So that brought them here. So the area that we're talking about uh, in terms of the Africa, early African-American community uh, is, was, is an area that was known as Renton uh, Hilltop or just Hilltop or some people just called it the country, right? It was the country. It was the country. And, um, and this neighborhood, um, which was bordered by, you see it in the map, bordered by um, Sunset Highway on the north, Maple, uh, Maplewood Golf Course on the south, and kind of went along Union Avenue and along each side. Um, that was the area that was predominantly, that was historically one of Renton's first African-American neighborhoods, okay? And of course, today we call that the Highlands, right? So it's that, that's the area that we're talking about. And some of the earliest maps actually show that in, uh, in uh, as late as 1892, um, much of the land was owned by Native Americans. So, uh, you know, that, I found that that was fascinating. And it was, uh, it, it wasn't a um, um, wanted area. There was a lot of swamps and uh, Honey Creek ran through there and uh, so it wasn't a, a, a desirable area, and uh, for some reason, all these families, black families, got directed to that street. And they were able to live there without being bothered. No, basically, nobody else wanted to live there. It was outside the city limits. Right. So why not, right? Our tour starts at the Greenwood Cemetery. How many of you know where the Greenwood Cemetery is? Oh, great. And, um, you know, you, I don't know if, if you know or not, it's, it, the Greenwood Cemetery is a 40-acre cemetery. Uh, the oldest markers in that cemetery date back to 1887. Uh, and then in, uh, and, and, and there were distinct areas of the cemetery uh, in its inception where people were buried by race. So there was the African-American area, the Asian area, the, um, uh, the, the uh, Pacific Islander area, Italian area. Italian area, and so forth. So even in death, people were not allowed to be side by side. And that was you know, pretty much the norm across the whole country. It wasn't just in Renton, I wanna say that. So for example, the Arlington Cemetery, 
uh, was established in 1864. And at that time, African-American soldiers were buried in separate sections from white soldiers. Um, and, and, that, and that went on until 1946 when President Harry S. Truman issued an executive order integrating the military. Uh, and, and though it was a gradual process on the battlefield, it was immediate in the cemeteries in Arlington. So one of the reasons that we started there is, uh, and this, the, what you're seeing is the area that historically was predominantly African-American. What I noticed um, when John took me there was how modest the markers were. Most of them are uh, just markers that lay right on the ground. And as you look around the cemetery, you see other areas, for example, where there are tall monuments that are markers. So there was like a distinct difference. And, uh, and as part of our journey, we found the markers of some of John's family members. So this is one uh, for yeah. Rosalie Donahue, and she was... She's my, um, she's my uh, aunt, um, married to my father's brother. Um, and they lived in Seattle. And so they, for her to be buried in Renton, to me it's an honor because that's where you know, my family first came to. Um, came to after they, my dad lived in Bremerton for few years and worked in a shipyard, um, he couldn't, he'd always worked in the fields in Louisiana. He's from, my parents from rural Louisiana and uh, he came here to work in the shipyards um, and the reason he came here, because uh, he couldn't go back home because he was, uh, it was said that, I don't know if it's a tale. My dad, he stretched the truth sometimes, but <laughs> he said that he couldn't go back home. He never went back. He came to Washington State in 1946, I believe. He never went home. So I kind of believe him. Um, so anyways, um, for my family, for his brothers and sisters to, to be buried here, it's kind of an honor, uh, mm -hmm. honor for my family. Way to keep the family together. Uh, the next marker that we found was actually uh, the marker for George Houston. And he was the guy who started it all. Now there's about 2,000 Houstons in, in Washington State, but he's the guy who started it all. He, uh, he it was a, a leap of faith and, and I think some fear that, that brought him from uh, Monroe, Louisiana uh, to Bremerton, Washington. Again, um, uh, he was he was a young man at that time, and and this country was it was not nice. It was not nice to uh, to black people coming from the south. So he took uh, a, a real leap of faith. He wanted to get out of the south. Uh, he wanted to raise his kids, uh, give his kids a better chance. He didn't want us picking strawberries or sweet potatoes or peanuts. Uh, so. He came out, worked at the shipyard in Bremerton, saved enough money to, um, he didn't like punching that clock. He had always gotten up with the sun, <clears throat> you know, went to the strawberry fields. He raised strawberries, he worked at the strawberry farm. Uh, supposed to be the, some of the best strawberries in the, in the country in a little place called Roseland, Louisiana. But um, he just couldn't punch that clock. So, um, and my mom was still in, in Louisiana, and uh, he decided uh, that he was going to look for some property to buy, and whoever it was directed him to uh, the Renton Highlands where there were other black people living. That, um, and it was the only place in Renton at that time that black people lived. Um, God, I was hoping Pat was uh, Shropshire, was here, Damon's mom was here, but. Um, it was the only, it was the only area in the city of Renton. Uh, it wasn't Talbot Hill. It wasn't um, Lake Ridge, um, and it was that street in Renton. And mm -hmm. so, anyways, uh, he, his brothers and sisters followed him out here, and um, uh, eventually, um, I don't know if it was gentrification in the Highlands or not, but uh, they ended up moving out of there because it came part of the city of Renton. That street came part of the city of Renton and got really expensive. Um, 
at that time. It was really expensive for the people. Most of the people didn't work. There was janitors. Uh, there was septic or uh, septic tank cleaners. Uh, my dad. We raised pigs. We raised animals. My dad jumped cars. He tore down houses. My dad tore down a lot of the houses for uh, St. Anthony's over here uh, for their parking lots and, and other buildings. Um, my dad was, uh, he became really close with the Italian community here that kept him working. And my mom worked in their houses. Um, so, um, for St. Anthony's. I'm not Catholic. My dad wasn't Catholic, that's for sure, but sure did a lot of work for, uh, for, that, for that community. And it was an Italian community that embraced the people on that hill. My dad worked for um, Tino Cagini um, that used to have a, a, garbage, a garbage dump going up the hill past Mount Olivet Cemetery there, down in the, where the houses are now. Those people are living in a garbage dump. <laughs> <laughs> but they, but Tino Cagini um, kind of adopted my dad. My dad would go in and collect aluminum, glass, take it to Seattle and sell it. Uh, there was another uh, a gentleman, Mike Lotto, who owned the shopping center in the Highlands where, where, where we worked at, Dave. Uh, but Mike Lotto owned a lot of real estate and commercial property and renting. He made sure that my mom worked and uh, Mike made sure that, that, that my dad had work also. So it was Italian community that um, here in South Renton that, um, that held, <coughs> held my family up. Um, so you, some of you or most of you may know that also in the uh, Greenwood Cemetery is the Jimi Hendrix Memorial. That was dedicated in uh, 2002. And uh, his family uh, actually raised the money to build that memorial. And uh, it's, it's quite a large structure. Um, it actually includes um, burial plots for his entire family in the future. The 54 different spots, they're not all used. So you see these uh, kind of pedestals here. Each one of those is a space and it goes all the way around where uh, family members uh, can be buried as, uh, as needed. And uh, if you go inside the rotunda, uh, John and I saw some, uh, something pretty interesting. There is a, a marble slab. Uh, there, um, the guitar that you see was, uh, was actually installed uh, pretty recently. And on that marble slab in front of the guitar, a visitor <coughs> Uh, leave little artifacts <laughs> to honor Jimi Hendrix. We found some of the most interesting things. People left photos of themselves. Uh, they left uh, beer bottles, beer cans, um, little roaches, uh, not, not the animals, but the, not the, the insects, but little <laughs> marijuana roaches, roach clips. Um, I mean, it was just fascinating what people chose to leave it there. It was a nice day at the cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, you know, we understand that actually some of the um, uh, tour buses have this memorial on their, as a stopping point on their site. Go ahead, Rich. When the sister city from Nishiwaki were here, this was one of the places they all wanted mm. to go to. Ah, so, so it's even known in, in Japan, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. If you go there and stand there for 15 or 20 minutes, you're going to hear languages from around the world that come here to our beautiful city of Renton. Mm -hmm. One of the things that John and I found in our research was that on, uh, on April 19th of last year, the Renton Highland Post Office was renamed the James Marshall Jimi Hendrix Post Office. And it's only the fourth post office in the state to receive an honorary name. And it's right here in Renton. We're, we're, for, we're on the map in so many ways, <laughs> you know, but I've, I've lived here for over 25 years and I love Renton. Um, when we go just beyond the, um, the uh, Hendrix Memorial, you know, this is an area, this is called the Garden of an, an Eternal Peace Pagoda uh, that was built in 2006. 
uh, to honor Asian families in the area. And, and before that pagoda was built, this was an area in the cemetery where uh, their Asian family members could be buried. There's another one called uh, the Lotus Garden. And, um, and, and, and even in death, it was an inclusive community. You did not have to be Asian to be buried there. But, uh, but, uh, but people of Asian ancestry didn't have options about where else they might be buried in the cemetery. So we found that interesting. And didn't you say his stepmother was uh, his stepmother's Korean? Korean. Mm -hmm. um, so his memorial is actually halfway between what was historically the African-American burial area and the Asian burial area. And we, we wonder if his family intentionally did that to show their unity as a family. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing. Um, yeah, I, I, I look at that, that monument and uh, to Jimi Hendrix and it's just amazing um, how much he is honored and, and to be buried here in Renton of, of all places. It was a beautiful place to him. Uh, it was a peaceful place to him and it's where he wanted to be buried. For a, for a while there, they, they had torn down the house that his father lived in on Seward Park and they were going to rebuild it across from the cemetery, but I guess the permits, uh, I have to talk to Armando about that. that some, some, some of the permits, some of the, they didn't, couldn't get the permits to rebuild the house, so uh, he had a lot of love. <laughs> had, there was a lot of love, love for the city of Renton. We're going uh, now continuing up 4th Avenue, and when you get to Union Avenue and turn right, uh, just uh, a few hundred feet down is a park known as Heritage Park. How many of you have been to Heritage Park? Now, it's a beautiful park. It's a beautiful park. Pardon? I grew up here. You grew tell, tell us about it. Is that well, Kent? that's the property that I no. grew up on. I am the last of five and Bernie's part oh. child. I'm the last one. So I grew up on that four acre property. At six acres, but the park is only four acres. And so when my father passed away, the city had been wanting that property for years and years, and my dad would never sell it. So when he passed away in um, 02, of course, it was only me and my sister. So, of course, it was sold to the city. So it's a beautiful park, um, just gorgeous park. I wish it had been uh, a little larger because there was more property back further that they could have gone back. And there was a pond back there in the back mm -hmm. also that my dad raised catfish. Ah, which was that's amazing. <laughs> we, we had heard, we had heard that that was Barksdale property originally. Uh-huh, in our research we discovered that. Now this is the power of our city government because, and, and residents working together. Because initially that park was going to be called, um, Heritage, right? No, Heather Downs. Heather Downs. Heather Downs. And, uh, and you, you know about this? I know about Heather Downs. You know about Heather Downs? Yeah, I know what it is. Yeah, it's across the park. Okay, <laughs> yes. So, uh, but community members said, wait a minute. You know, they, they uh, uh, asked council, the city council members at that time to intervene because they felt because of the historical nature of that property that it really deserved some acknowledgement of that. And so the name of the park was changed to Heritage Park. Uh, to in order to remember that this was the early earliest African American neighborhood in Renton, and one of the things that's just fascinating, and, and if you visited the park, um, you're aware of that, is the kiosk area. Liz, you were involved in that, right? Yeah. yeah tell us about that. Um, so I worked with the team. I'm sorry. I'm the director of the Renton History Museum. Oh, Liz Stewart. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, I had only been here about six or eight months, um, and I worked with a team of community members and folks from the city. We collected oral histories and photographs, and then we also did kind of your traditional document research. Um, and we tried to recreate the story of the, um, of the neighborhood that had been there. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you see in this kiosk area. And uh, I know we, t uh, John and I have talked to many residents who hope that a more permanent uh, display can be made, but 
it's just, it's full of history. There's pictures. We tried to take a close up to give you a sense. Uh, but Heritage Park history, um, you see like pre-1990, uh, or let's see, pre-1900, pre, pre 1910, 1915. So you see some of the building structures that were in the area and some of the faces of the people that were in the area. It's, it's, it's jam-packed with history of the people that, uh, that lived there um, once the land uh, transitioned from the uh, indigenous uh, native people who, who were there originally. Linda's family, I, is you from, from Tennessee? What? Yes. Um, he's coming to the store where uh, Dave and I worked at uh, Mayfair down on Sunset, and uh, uh, he's a big man. Your brother, John Barfield, who played sports at Renton also, uh, big men, uh, and, and, and John did a lot here in the city of Renton, uh, and, and, and we'll talk about that later, but it, there, was, there was so much that came from that small, small community. Uh, Damien's Uncle Bill was a long military career. Um, so there, there, there's just so much there uh, that, that, that we'll talk about later. Thank you. Our, re our research in, in, in John's memory um, told us that, uh, that some of the families that owned large uh, places, uh, plots of land in that area were the Nunn family, uh, the Barfields, the Shropfields, and, and Smith. Shropshire. Shrop Shropshire, right. Shrop Shropshire. The, the, nuns, the nuns lived, he was our barber. We had, we, we had there was two barbers. Down the little. Between us and the right. So next to the, the final picture we took of, of the display at Heritage Park and, and right adjacent to the park is the, uh, is the Shropshire home. It's still standing. Yep, that's, uh, is Candace here? Pat's here. Pat's here? Uh, um, Pat was a couple years older than me, but... but You're not uh, supposed to say that. Well, I can, <laughs> and, and she's proud of it. I know she is. <laughs> but... Um, uh, her brother Steve was, was more my age, and there was Butch or Al and, and Bill. Bill was, uh, was Bill, maybe? Maybe. But it was, um, uh, that house there um, it was uh, the Shropshire house, and, and uh, I, I, I remember when your dad and Steve moved to 23rd and Jefferson and Seattle, because I went to church a block from there, and then we'd get to meet up with Steve when we went to church. Uh, but I, 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 I remember clearly uh, um, the Shropshire family, and I, I even remember when Damien finally came on the scene, started running around with the little Weathers kids and that. But, um, I, I never imagined, you have to be proud of your son, uh, I never imagined that he would have become the superintendent of Renton Schools. Um, so in, in, uh, in this next picture, uh, and they, and we're, if you're standing with John and me on the corner of, uh, of Union and Fourth looking north, and so if, if you could just imagine, you know, in the, in the uh, 1900s, that that whole area was pretty much inhabited by large tracts of land held by uh, African-American families. And uh, you know, we, like Kiwan where Kiwanis Park is, you know, all of that land on either side of the street and extending out quite a ways. And um, we, we, um, heard, uh, we learned that uh, part of one, there was a homestead on that land. Uh, one of the fa homesteading families was a Grayson family. The Grayson, the mm -hmm. Grayson family lived a um, um, little bit east of 132nd or Union, uh, big plot of land that they actually homesteaded. And as far as I know, that was the first, uh, we used to call him Old Man Grayson. There was a, a, a building right there on Cemetery Road that he had a church at. So um, there was um, a little bit of misunderstanding about the first church. And, but that's the first church that I remember in, in Renton. Then there was Kenny Dale where your mom mm -hmm. went and- Was uh, that Reverend Jones? Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the Reed family lived, um, Yep, yeah, so uh, just, just, there's some great history. There, there were some large landowners um, on, on that hill. And it, it, it's uh, the Grayson family, uh, and I, I'll tell a story. Uh, Benita had mentioned the post office. Um, they were supposed to build a post office or the government wanted to build 
uh, transfer station on the Grayson's property. They never built it. And if you know that area now, you know what's on that, on that property. There's houses that I, I couldn't afford to live in, a lot of houses. And uh, once uh, the families, uh, the Grayson family, just like mine, once they got the little bit of money that they, you know, they became bad alcoholics, uh, uh, Gene and Bud, Dave knew, um, Bud or Gene, one of them, but um, it just, it, the, the dysfunction, the, the tearing up of families and tearing up of lives because of eminent domain and uh, is how my parents lost their property, the 10 acres next to Honeydew School, mm -hmm. eminent domain. Uh, so, the, so these large tracts of land, despite the fact that they were swamp land and wooded and so forth, the, this was working land. Families, uh, they, families raised food to sustain themselves. Uh, they raised um, uh, animals, to s uh, chickens. Uh, John mentioned his family raised pigs. And, uh, and they sold those. People would actually come from uh, Seattle to come to that area to buy fresh poultry, egg, get eggs, uh, pork, and, and so forth. So it was, uh, it, was a, a, it was a very entrepreneurial community. So not only did the land allow them to support their families, but it also allowed them to make a living uh, for their families. And some of the families uh, who lived in that area, uh, the Grinch and the Graysons, the Williams family, Weathers, Smith, Winston, Harris, Wooten, Bond, Durant, Nunn, and uh, Bostock. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We um, also, I learned a little bit of lore about the community. Um, right now, uh, this is a, an apartment complex, um, and you see the parking lot in the apartments, but uh, in the day, Which one is this that? is where uh, the grocery store was, okay. or Papa Sim's Barbecue, and there was a grocery store next to it, uh, and that, that uh, establishment was really a hub in the community. Uh, families, uh, a lot of the families in that area came from the south. Uh, and so um, they couldn't go to Safeway and buy a lot of the products that they were used to using, uh, whether that be um, certain kinds of mustard, collard greens, et cetera. Uh, and so um, uh, Papa Sims uh, had this store, uh, wh which during the day was a, was a busy uh, place, a community hub. And then at night, what happened? At night, there was a lot of lies were being swapped, uh, mostly by the men. It was they. They drank. Uh, my dad made wine. Um, I think he probably compared it to some of the guys down here in the South Renton. <laughs> but he made wine, and, and, uh, and I guess it was pretty good wine. But um, there was uh, Papa Sims also, there's, there's barbecue there. I believe there's Papa Sims and Mama Daisy, um, which were connected to the Bostock family. But um, um, it, 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 that was the community. Right across the street from there, there was the Rutgers Barber Shop. Um, then Mr. Nunn also, uh, Paul Nunn also cut hair, but um, there's a barber shop there. Because we couldn't go to uh, a barber shop down here on 3rd or over in the Highlands community. Walk in and say, oh, we don't cut your hair. Um, so we had our own barber shop. We had a little store there where we'd get collard greens or mustard greens or ham hocks or neck bones. We had, there was a place to do that. Uh, my parents had, had lockers at a farmer's market um, where we sold meat out of. My, I think the most, uh, we had 80 head of pigs, 80 pigs. That was the most we ever had, but it was work. Um, I've got a good friend here that I've known all my life, Dave Skelton. Um, and he thought it was cool when the pigs got out and ran out and the honeydew, but that was work. For <laughs> we had to work and they said, hey, John, we'll go help you catch your pigs, man. <laughs> but, um, and, uh, uh, you know, Dave's been uh, Cub Scouts together and, and um, he's been a good friend for um, at least 60 years. So, um, but, but he knows, Dave knows some of the life that we lived. We didn't have very much, uh, but this guy here never, mm -hmm. it didn't matter to him. Mm -hmm. 
And and right. and given that that people that no one had a, a, a lot, um, it still was a community that took care of of each other, and so there, it was a strong community, uh, and, a, and a community. You know, it reminded me. I grew up in Portland, Oregon, but it reminded me of the community where I grew up, uh, which was a part of Portland. It was predominantly African American, and if you did something you weren't supposed to do. Mm -hmm. You know, any one of the neighbors could give you a spanking, and if you told your parents about it when you got home, then they gave you a spanking on top of the first one because mm -hmm. they said, well, you know, you shouldn't have got a spanking. And, but it was that kind of community where you know, we didn't have to worry about, you know, as kids we could, you know, run to the community. We felt safe and we were safe because all the adults in the community looked out for us. And I, when I hear you talk about uh, the Helltop area, I get that same sense. There was. Uh, if, we, if we did something wrong and somebody saw it, it, it wouldn't take too long to get down the street <laughs> to, to home. Um, I, I will say something about this, and I, and I, and I, I don't want to get too much into it, but there was the racism. There was the, the name calling or the rock throwing. Uh, um, I was thinking about my sister Betty today. Who Betty never, she passed away, I think, three years ago. Um, she never got over it. She, she wasn't able to, to get through the racism, you know, that I'm sure all of us saw in, in, in living in Renton. She just, it, it taught her to hate. Mm. And, 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 and it's sad. It, it's sad where um, some people can work their way through it. And it's not a, it just, it, she couldn't, she couldn't kick it. She was, hurt too much mm. as a child and uh, uh, but the like I said the people that white people that would have interest in our community they were with you thick and thin but there were some that actually hate we had two houses burned down they were never they never found out who burned our houses down there was, a there was a stick of dynamite stuck on our front porch. They never found out who did it. Um, and this all goes to, uh, you know, my parents ended up losing that property to the Renton School District. Um, it, was, it was taken from them. But prior to the Renton School District taking my parents' property, two houses burned down, stick of dynamite st stuck on our porch. In 1966, 1967, they filed eminent domain to take that property. So if you look at the next slide, um, you know, today's, uh, where Honeydew School is today, uh, was right, this was the, the general area where your family's uh, property was, right? Right, right next to it. Right next to it. Uh, one of the things that we did, this is a contrast. Uh, this is Honeydew School today. This is where it says, um, where you, you see the, the uh, welding supply. That's not the one you went to, Dave. <laughs> the welding supply, that was the site of the original Honeydew School. And thanks to the Renton History Museum, we were actually able to get a picture of the uh, original uh, Honeydew School. Uh, with, what, what did you say, was it a two home? It was a two room school and the creek ran right underneath the school. Um, God, we're old. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a two-room school. There was, um, it's just set right at the corner of Sunset and Union or 132nd. And the creek ran right underneath the school. And mm -hmm. the, there was a feed store right there also. That creek ran underneath. Mm -hmm. This was, uh, we found this picture too through, with the help of the Renton History Museum. You know, if, if any of you ever want to do research about Renton, see Liz and Kate, mm -hmm. the team here. They have so so, you know, I, I don't know how you archive all of this, but they have uh, so much information. I remember when I first met Elizabeth Stewart, and uh, that was uh, shortly after I began working with the city, and, and she said that her vision was to uh, really hold a museum that uh, reflected everyone in the community of Renton. And uh, she's done a tremendous amount of research to make that a reality. Uh, this we found this 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 picture um, in the archives of uh, of the museum, and this was um, a, a classroom, a, a, one of the a group of students who went to the original Honeydew in 1937. 
So oh, some bad kids. <laughs> So, so that gives you an idea. This, where John is standing, the, the handsome guy there on the right, uh, where John is standing, this was the heart of his family's homestead. And where you see that fence, it's around a wetland area, and that's the old Honey Creek, right? That's right, Honey Creek, it goes, goes there, then it goes underneath the, where the school is now and comes out um, on the other side, goes down over sunset. But that's a, a pond that uh, me and my brothers and sisters caught frogs and snakes. And it was, uh, it was our, our go-to place. Um, spent a lot of, lot of time on that pond. We built rafts um, and then once it was gone, um, you know, it, it, it took something away from my family. It not only not only the property, but it was our it was our it was our quiet place. I could go out. There was ten acres of land. I can go out to the deepest part of those woods and not hear anything. Nothing but birds and probably bears. I don't know. But I don't know who was out there. <laughs> <laughs> but. But I can go to that place, and, 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 and still to this day, I have places that I can go and just sit and block everything out to this very day. I had that there. My brothers and sisters had that there. And uh, um, once the, the Renton School District, they didn't build a school. They were going to build it. They said the area was growing so fast that they needed our property. Um, to build another middle school. They never built it. They kept it to the, you know, as long as they had to. Then it was sold. Gave my parents nothing. But when you go on that property now, there's probably 200 houses, probably $600,000 each. So there was, you know, I, I, I don't know for sure, but I, I was angry about it. But I'm, I'm, I'm not angry about it anymore. Um, I would like to know uh, who the developer was that bought it, though. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we actually found some homes that John uh, remembered from his childhood. Some of the families that you knew lived there. And, um, um, and one of the things that, that John um, uh, shared with me was uh, some of the brilliance of that community. Uh, so many people who, um, who went on to um, really support the growth and prosperity in Renton. A lot of professional athletes grew up in that area. Um, George remembered um, George Reed, uh, who uh, was with Saskatchewan Rough Riders football. Um, he went out for the NFL. They said he was too small to play, so he went to Canada and uh, to this day, he's one of the top running backs in uh, CFL history. And Joyce Reed, his sister's here with us this evening. Uh, there was Clarence Clancy Williams, who played for Washington State in the LA Rams. Uh, Tony Roten Sr., who played for UW and then five years for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Tony Roten Jr. played for UW and in the NBA for the Memphis Grizzlies and uh, Philadelphia 76ers, and now plays basketball in China. Uh, Frank Reed uh, played at Hazen and, and uh, at a state championship and spent five years with the Atlanta Falcons uh, and two with the Birmingham Stallions. And so, you know, I mean, think about I me mean, for such a small community to have, uh, you know, and that's just one aspect of, um, of the community, some of their star athletes uh, and, and others who went on to, um, to really uh, It'd be, be the first in many ways in the community. You could probably go to Los Angeles or New York, San Francisco, and not find that many professional athletes on one street, a short street. It would, I, 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 I would bet money that um, you couldn't do that in many major cities. I, I, I don't know of any, but it was, um, I, I lived right across from Honey, right next to Honeydew School, and when George and Clarence, um, Butch, Bill, um, John, all they would be out there. I could sit on my as a little kid. I could sit there and watch these future uh, NFL players 
uh, from my front porch. And it was, it was, it was just amazing. Um, the Renton High School teams were good, great at those times. I used to sneak into the games just to see those guys play. Um, also had Xavier Bonds lived on that street. First Washington State, <clears throat> black Washington State patrolman, uh, which is amazing. Um, uh, Esther Williams, who served, I think, on the park board. Ex Esther Weathers on the park board of uh, Renton. Um, was an amazing lady. Um, John Barfield, John Coleman Barfield. Um, I think also served uh, some capacity for the city of Renton. Um, but it's just so much history for, on, on, that, on, on that small street. Uh, we had one uh, African-American teacher, uh, I, it might, might have been two, I think Hercules, Mr. Hercules, I think was at, or Hercules Anderson, I think was at McKnight also. But we had Clifford Donnelly, uh, who passed away a, a few years ago, who was uh, a mentor to many of us. He, he kept a lot of us in school, a lot of the black kids in school. Um, it wasn't really, it wasn't fair. It wasn't fair. Um, and Damien, I hope you don't mind, I'm sharing this, but, and, and Pat, but Damien said that his mother could not remember one special teacher. Everybody has a special teacher that they had going through school, uh, that his mom couldn't remember one special teacher. Uh, Clifford Donnelly was mine. Um, he probably tempered, probably either kept me out of jail or kept me alive, I don't know. But he was, uh, he would say, Houston, you can't do that. Um, I said, but he hit me first. He still can't do that. And, and, and it was amazing for that, for the mid 60s, late 60s, for somebody to say that, that you can't strike back at somebody. And, and, and he grew up in the South. Uh, uh, he was, uh, had two master's degrees, fought in the Korean War. Um, I think he ended up being a vice principal at Hazen, but he grew up in the South, but he always said, do not fight back. You're not gonna win it. You know, you're not gonna win. Eventually you're gonna be kicked out of school. So he was a great man. So there were some, some really great uh, mentors uh, and athletes from that, mm -hmm. that street. So we're going to uh, wind up our tour uh, down in, in, actually in downtown Renton. Some of you may know this structure. Today it's the Daystar Baptist Church. And um, what we've learned from, from uh, tapping the wisdom of community members is that um, it, in downtown Renton, it's possibly the first African-American church in downtown Renton. Uh, at one time it was the Solid Rock Baptist Church, and then it became the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Baptist Church. And, and then with that church then moved, uh, interestingly enough, back to Hilltop where they, they built a church and they're still there today. Um, and so uh, that, that structure on, at, on uh, Smithers, which sits right in the middle of a residential area with houses all around it, uh, is still there and it's still uh, a hub in the community. So what we want to know at this point is, you know, what did you learn? What questions do, did you add? Or excuse me, what questions do you have? Or, or what would you like to add to, uh, to the history? Yes. Good question. In the picture, the class picture of 37, um, it looked like it was um, way back there, but it looked like it was a little more integrated than the impression I was getting. Yes. Was the community integrated soon? Uh, you know, a little bit, or was it pretty much American? Pretty solid. Yeah, it, you know, if, if if you remember where the, the you know the, the the original school was right on the corner of what would be what Fourth and and uh, Sunset, right? Yes. Yeah, and so that north. yeah North, and uh, and so um, Sunset was kind of the the the, the street that was the line. That was kind of the end. You know, there were some uh, some people of African ancestry who lived beyond there, and 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 some white people who lived south of there. But that was kind of the line. So the school, uh, we would imagine, drew from that area. Do you have any recollection? I, I, I don't know if it was really integrated. The only thing I know is that's where all the black people live. So I, I don't know if it was integration or it was just because that where the black people lived. Because in the other on the uh, other parts of Renton, I mean, they were uh, white. 
So it was just where, where the black families mm -hmm. lived. I don't think they were. Um, it wasn't an all black school. No, no. And so, what, so when they were moving there in the 40s and 50s, was that because of the redlining? Did that have something mm -hmm. to do with it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's inter that we, we probably didn't call it that in Renton, but it was our own mini version, if you will, of, yeah. of redlining because, uh, you know, what would often happen is that uh, people of color would get directed to certain areas or could only buy in certain areas. Uh, John had an interesting experience many, many years later because you left Renton, right, and you came back, came back. and you were working with a realtor uh, who was going to show you some homes, yeah. and, oh. and you were looking at Bryn Mawr, uh, what's uh, now Lake, Lake Ridge, Lake Ridge, and the the realtor said, "I've got I've got a perfect house for you." And where was it? <laughs> he led me right back to Heather Downs. <laughs> 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 so it, it's um, I don't I don't know if if my dad didn't know anybody in Washington when he came here. He didn't know anybody, but all of a sudden he's directed somehow finds his way to the Brenton Highlands. Uh, so yeah, there was some red lining. I don't know if or redirecting, yeah. mm -hmm. um, this is where you'll feel more comfortable at or, or, this or is, you or, can't live here. Or this is the, the area where the bank will finance your purchase of this property. And so, you know, remember that, you know, when we talk about like things like redlining, these, uh, that came out of federal policies. You know, that, that came out of, you know, federal housing administration yeah. who, um, you know, I always found this interesting because this is your ta our tax dollars at work, right? Because <laughs> we all pay taxes and then your tax dollars are at work prevent you from living where you want to live. But um, re prior to uh, World War II, to buy a house in the United States, the terms were 50% down and then you had five years to pay the balance. Yeah. And when all these servicemen returned from the war and wanted to buy homes and start their families, that's when the FHA was founded, the Federal Housing Administration, and they came up with this grand scheme. Uh, we, how, about, uh, to pay, how about if you pay 10 or 20% down and then the banks finance it for 30 years? Well, you can imagine the banks kind of came unglued, you know, because they could just see foreclosures and losing their money. But the federal government had a solution. They said, banks, we will back every single loan as long as you follow the federal underwriter guidelines. And the federal underwriter guidelines said, do not sell even to one family of color in a predominantly white community because it will erode the value of that community. And so uh, that's why we have uh, segregated areas. As a matter of fact, uh, we've talked to some people in Seattle who have houses that, that old houses that have been here for a while and on their title deed, it still has covenants that says this house cannot be sold to people from this group. I mean, it was like, you know, pick a group. It was, you know, in some areas it was Catholics, Jews, uh, uh, people, Italians. Uh, the Italians. They, uh, they, they called African people in some of those early title deeds Ethiopians, but they meant anyone of African descent. Hawaiian was another designation that we saw. So, you know, on these title deeds, it basically said, you cannot sell this house to someone from that group. And, uh, yes? Well, I, I just add one thing. I was, in the 60s, I was from the liberal wing, and we had a very conservative <coughs> Archbishop, Catholic Archbishop, uh, Archbishop Cotton. And at that, how naive I was in 63. But he, he told uh, every, Catholic Church in the Archdiocese of Seattle that they had that uh, there was a moral obligation that any Catholic should vote for open housing. That, wow. that and that was and this is Archbishop Conley was an extremely conservative Catholic Archbishop, but he had said at that time, and all of us liberals were like, "Woo, this is great." <laughs> he actually. <laughs> had read on Sundays from the church pulpit that they were to vote for open housing. Now, it's one thing to vote for something and then it to be implemented. Obviously, it took 30 years, 40 years, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. But at that time, for him, uh, he actually took a lot of flack from that. And, uh, you know, I was a junior in high school at that time. 
And uh, that was pretty amazing mm -hmm. that he would take a stand like that. Absolutely. And it was just like there were other people that recognized the mm -hmm. truth of the value of every human being. And I thought that was a, a good statement at the time. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I was, uh, there's an incredible website that's maintained by University of Washington, and it's called the Seattle Civil Rights and Labor History Project. And Professor, it's Professor James Gregory, right, right Liz? Who uh, every year has his students work on that. And, uh, and they basically have built build histories of Seattle. PowerPoints, there's articles, there's oral histories that you can hear, and uh, there's a timeline. It's an interesting timeline, and I actually used that in a workshop I did for a community organization because what, what was really fascinating to me was every single group, every faith group, every ethnic group in Seattle, at some point, every labor group, at some point in time joined the civil rights struggle. So it was a huge collaborative venture. You know, it wasn't just one group or one individual. It took all of us working collectively together. And, um, you know, my dad was the uh, first uh, uh, African-American police officer hired uh, by the Portland Police Department. And um, he was awarded um, uh, a medal, their medal uh, posthumously, that was the highest level uh, possible because honoring him for that. And the police chief at that time gave my sister and me a Xerox copy of my father's personnel jacket. I mean, right. they had it after all those years. And the thing that immediately stood out for us was the, um, when they were considering his appointment, was the number of groups, different faiths, different groups, who wrote to the mayor saying, we highly recommend that you hire this man as police officer. And, uh, and it took the community behind him uh, for him to actually be hired. Into I'm going to say one more thing before I, it's getting kind of late here about, about the city of Renton and the resilience of those families up there on that hill. Uh, I'm proud to be a part of, of uh, you know, uh, of that street. Um, it's a history that, uh, like I said earlier, uh, that probably would have disappeared. I, I still talk to people today and say, I didn't know that all oh, you guys lived on the same street. Well, I didn't know that uh, your house burned down. I didn't know that there was these things happening in that community. I didn't know about George Reed or Frank Reed, Gary Reed or Joyce Reed, I, you know, I, or, or Damien uh, Patnod. I didn't know that his family, they, they don't know that. But this is something that, uh, this is a great city. And, and you see it today. Uh, we have black police officers, we have black principals, we have black coaches, uh, we have a black a superintendent. Bla a, bl a black deputy chief. Um, so th th this, is, this is a great city. And, and, and I, I, I want to think that our parents had something to do with us getting here. So you know, I, I, I want us to stand up and be proud of, of, of the black history, that little street up there in the Highlands. Yeah, that's where I'm from. Nothing could take that away. Uh, we, we withstood the, uh, the hard times, um, and we could celebrate the good times now. John and I want to just say thank you all for coming. We, every time we do this presentation, we learn more because you all come and you share your stories and share your wisdom, and uh, that's what oral history is all about. And, um, you know, for uh, compared to a lot of you, I've only been here 25 years, so I'm kind of a newcomer in Renton. But uh, but I, I love this city, and I love learning more about it. And um, uh, and and when I talk to people who've just arrived here in the last several years, and and I often say, well, what made you move to Renton? And the first nine times out of ten, what they will say is because of the diversity. Mm -hmm. You know, people of many ages, mm -hmm. of many faiths of many ethnicities, races, you know, no matter who we are, we feel at home here.